Welcome to this real-time horse portrait. I'm going to chat to you about my art, I'm going to chat to you about the portrait itself and share some of my best tips for horse portraiture. The materials are listed down below for you and I'm using a sand-coloured board because it harmonises so well with the horse portrait. So I usually begin with the eye. It really sets up your tonal range for the painting. I know I say it a lot but it's so true and just a word to the wise, I probably would just double check that you're happy with your outline before you go in. Horses eyes are so beautiful to do, but they are very dark usually. Obviously not if you've got blue in there. The browns are usually very, very dark. So I like to mix my dark browns with a dark gray. And that way you get that really sort of luscious, rich dark that almost doesn't look like it's a color. I tend not to leave a lot of colour in the horse's eyes, especially because of the way I like to draw the horse coat. I add a lot of colours into them because they're like velvet. They almost have a slight iridescent look to them in some lights because the, the short coat can really play with the light in different ways. I'm just being really, really careful. I keep pausing to have a look at my reference photo, which is slightly awkward in this setup. Whenever I'm filming, I can't have my reference photo directly next to my drawing. So I'm constantly cricking my neck around. Now there is actually quite a lot of detail in this eye. I'm not going to be putting all of it in. You don't need to, it's a very small space. We need to get a good effect of light instead. That's what I'm, I'm more interested in. So I'm glazing over the top of some of that blue and that is desaturating it. And desaturating means that there is less color in there. So if you mix, if you mix two different colors together, you're going to desaturate them because if we mixed a blue and a pink together, we don't end up with a blue or a pink. We've desaturated the original colors. And then when you mix any color with a gray or a brown, you are going to also desaturate it, but quite significantly. If you've got a chromatic gray, which means that it's a gray made only out of black and white instead of any colors, then the desaturation will be quite flat. But if you use a chromatic gray, which means that the gray has some colors mixed into it, then your desaturation will probably be a bit more interesting. I tend to like using chromatic grays, especially if I'm painting and able to physically mix myself new colors. I'm gonna try using a little bit of this green. It's the 172. It's a nice sagey green, and this is quite a desaturated green. It's very soft, it's a little bit gray. But because the coat has quite a lot of orange in, by using a green, which is the complementary color, the opposite color, we can actually make the orange pop a little bit more. And again, it makes your drawings a little bit more interesting. A nice little rule, well, not a rule, but I suppose a tip is if you want to be using complementary colors, try using the complement to the main color. So the main color for this is effectively an orange. Try using the complement, the opposite color for that. And it's opposite on the color wheel in the shadows or the darker areas. And that's, that's quite a nice little rule to follow along. So for anyone who follows along the step-by-step -step tutorials, you'll probably notice when I'm doing my actual drawings that I hop around between my pencils a lot more. I find it really difficult when I'm teaching and definitely descend into poor teaching practices at time. I, I find it very difficult not to flip between pencils because this is how I naturally draw and how most people naturally draw. You know, it's a way of seeing and we're constantly pulling and pushing until we find that happy medium. So whenever I am teaching, I do encourage people to, you know, go back through, pick up previous pencils if you need to. You don't actually follow it step by step because our drawings will progress at different rates and they'll always end up looking different. So there are a couple of reference photos that I could have chosen for this portrait. Some of them had really good lighting. Some of them had pose that I think, you know, the, the angle of the head or the neck was a bit better. But I ended up going for this one as much as it might feel a little bit more obvious, simply because... She was looking directly at the camera and there's that immediate connection that we can bring to life on the page. And being that it is a pet portrait, 
you want that emotional connection there. This isn't just a piece of art. It's it's a portrait of someone's best friend. So having having the eye looking directly at the camera worked so well that I, I couldn't resist what is potentially a little bit of an obvious photo. Um, but I did get sent through quite a lot of good reference photos for that I can use for lighting and for colour. One in particular has some great colours. She's in the sunshine um, with a slightly longer coat and the colours are really, really vivid. And I would have probably put those colours in anyway because it's what I like to do with horse portraits. So this is a nifty little pencil from the Holland range, number 44, so 8844 pastel pencil. You know what? I don't actually have any more of these pencils from this brand. I got them, I got them by accident years ago now, and it was just before my very first class. So this is what well, I don't know, maybe like four, four years ago, five years ago. It's quite funny, really. <laughs> I hadn't taught a class before. I just quit my my job. So I'd taken a part-time job with the National Trust, lovely place to work, while setting up my art business. I'd come back from traveling with my partner after university and accidentally collected some clients along the way uh, on some very wet, muddy evenings in New Zealand on, on these long walks you get talking to people. I mean, I just talk to anyone. And uh ended up with a, a little list of pet portraits to do by the time I got back to England and thought, well, you know what? I, I enjoy doing this and um, I'm, I'm going to try and give it a go. And I expected setting up the business to take years. You know, you hear of the starving artist and I just thought, you know, it's never really going to happen, but I will give it a go. So I got this part-time job at the National Trust while I was setting things up, but it actually came together very quickly to the point where I I only did four and a half months with the National Trust, which I felt very guilty about because it was a lovely job. And uh, yeah, I felt bad for leaving so early, but you know, things happen. So I quit because I had, um, I had an exhibition booked and it was booked at a place called Klein Norfolk Wildlife Trust. I used to live in Norfolk. It's where I grew up. It's an incredible place, Klein. It's salt marshes. And you get the migratory season twice a year. So the migratory season brings in bird watchers from all over the world, honestly, all over the world, America, Norway, all over Europe. People just come far and wide because it's an absolutely incredible place to come and watch, watch the birds. So I had an exhibition on during the migratory season, which I was very lucky to get really. It may not surprise you, there were a lot of birds in that exhibition. So I just quit my job. And it was a sellout show and, you know, I was on, I was on cloud nine. But when I'd set up this show with the Norfolk Wildlife Trust and, you know, they were saying, okay, well, we take X amount in commission. Yeah, 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 that's fine. And you need to pay for the room. Now, it wasn't a lot to pay for the room at all. But me being me, I was like, oh God, you know, pay for this and pay for that before I've even sold anything and I was worried I wasn't going to sell anything I've never done a, an exhibition before and they said um or you can do what some other artists do and you can run a workshop in which case you don't pay for the exhibition space obviously they still take commission on anything you sell and um I earn a little bit of money off the workshop and they earn enough money to not charge me for the room and I'd played around with this idea of teaching, but I'd never actually taught anything. And I was like, yeah, 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 I'll do a workshop, yeah. And I said it in such a way that they probably thought I did workshops, which I didn't. Um, so anyway, very long-winded way of telling you how I got this pencil. But uh, I set up a bumblebee workshop for my first class. And I was, I was really quite organized for it because I was so nervous about this but I was having major issues getting hold of a pencil. And because I never taught a class before, because I hadn't been drawing pastel pencils for that long, and because I was so nervous in my mind, I just thought I've got to have that exact pencil. I can't do it with another pencil. It won't work. The workshop's going to be a disaster. So I kept holding out trying to get this pencil and it got to a week before the workshop. And as much as I didn't need that exact pencil, I did need a dark brown, obviously, to be able to do the workshop. And uh, I rang up uh, where I used to get my pencils from before I started getting them from 
the lovely Angie and Chris at Paper Story. A little shout out to them. They're, they're a wonderful husband and wife team uh, based in Norfolk. So Paper Story art supplies are great for your pastel pencils. But I used to get them from a place called Pencils for Artists, another wonderful shop. Uh, but it's down in Devon, I think. And uh, they called me up and they, they got me the next best thing, if you like, over the phone, bless them. They were trying to help me out and find exactly what I needed and how hard or soft the pencil needed to be. And it ended up being this pencil, which is quite a reddish brown, to be honest. It's a bit more red than I wanted, um, but it's a lovely, lovely pencil. It's very, very soft. And I keep meaning to get more of these and try them out and, you know, do a little review because the amount of pigment that comes out of this pencil is actually really great. And I like the way it handles. I don't know why. I've just not, ever, not, not got around to, to getting any more. But um, luckily, the first workshop was a success somehow. I was a bag of nerves. I think wild, the Wildlife Trust did find out shortly after that that I hadn't actually ever taught anything before. <laughs> it, it, it came together, but obviously it could have it could have quite easily fallen apart. But no, it was the start of, the start of a really big part of being an artist for me. I, I really fell in love with teaching and um, I found that it, you know, improved my own, my own drawings as well quite a lot. You've really got to be able to put into words what, what you're doing. Um, which actually is quite difficult because quite often if you know you've taught yourself to draw in in the confines of your own home and whatever you, you don't necessarily verbalize in your mind what you're doing it starts to become somewhat intuitive instead so actually when someone asks you a question or you've got to explain why you're using that color and that tone and whatnot suddenly you think oh god well, why am I doing that so it's it's been a really great experience um definitely recommend to other artists out there to try teaching if you haven't because um, I found great joy in it and I've, I've found it so useful but there you go there's there's this random story of how I got a pencil <laughs> and really should try the rest of the range at some point so I'm just starting to build in some of the more interesting colors that I usually put into the coat um, I really like to make the most of these warm red tones so I just keep turning my head. You can probably hear me, sorry, turning away from the microphone. Let's have a look at the second reference photo where she stood in a field. That one just has the most gorgeous light. I mean, she's glowing. So as I'm, think I'm thinking as I'm going through this portrait how I want to manipulate the light a little bit more because on the original reference photo, it's, it's not flat in terms of, I can see details on her face, but the shadows aren't particularly pronounced and I want them much deeper. So I'm just going to dig out, I'm going to dig out another colour, believe it or not. This is what ends up happening. I get so many people saying, love your pencil holder. That's really great. Yeah, I don't use it. Um, it starts out full of pencils and they end up here. Got it. So this is the one I want, the 177, which actually, you know, if I'd been drawing with pastels longer, coming back to this long winded story of when I got the pencil, um, the 177 is the pencil that I should have replaced it with. It's, it's funny looking back because although I was drawing with my pastels quite a lot, I still hadn't discovered, so I don't know how, but I still hadn't discovered half of the pencils that were in the set. So I bought myself a full set of Faber-Castell. I'd also got some extra pencils from Cretacolor and I might've had a few from some other brands, um, but it was mainly, I had this full set. And honestly, I didn't find half the pencils in that set. I didn't start using them for ages. And, you know, I think it's a learning process. I, I used what I knew. I still created good drawings, but looking back, I just think, wow, I wasn't using some pencils that I just, I wouldn't live without now, such as a pencil I am using this drawing, I have already, uh, the 169. And again, it's like the, the 44. It's quite a deep, rich, purpley, See if I can find it. A deep, rich, purpley color, but also brown, this one. And I absolutely love this pencil. It is fantastic. But honestly, I didn't find it until about a year into my career of being a pastel pencil artist, despite the fact that it was sat there right in front of me. Just never picked it up. And I think it's because the color on the end, it does in person, it looks quite purple. So I just kept thinking, oh, well, that's a purple, you know, I'd use that for flowers or something. And at that stage, I didn't have as much knowledge about um, color theory. I just didn't have as much knowledge about ev ev anything, really. It was a lot of very intuitive drawing. I was was able to draw, but I'd never really used color. So it was a really big learning curve, but a great one. Now I look back only five years or so, 
and uh, the progress that I've made in terms of my learning is huge. And to be honest, a lot of that has come off from watching people on YouTube, really looking, studying pieces of art, looking at those, the, the color harmonies that have been created, thinking about why an artist has put that stroke there or why they've used that tone there and then experimenting within my own work. Um, I can't recommend it enough, but it it's about actively wanting to learn that makes a really big difference. I do it when I'm out on walks as well. I'll just be looking around at how the colors behave in nature because you can learn so much from the way that mother nature, if you like, how how a sunset, those colors are insane. But when you actually start to analyze them, you realize, well, hang on a minute, there's almost a green blue there next to a really pale yellow or next to a really pale pink. And oh, they're complementary colors. And this looks really beautiful when they're put next to each other. But then in other situations, a pink and a green are gonna clash and they'll look disgusting. And why is that? Oh, well, if we come back to the sunset, they, they're both harmonized together, not by their color, because their color is complementary, but they're harmonized because the tone of them the same, or is maybe the saturation is the same, you know. By really looking at the world around me, I started to learn how I could mix colors to create some exciting results, and also how not to mix colors to create disgusting sludgy messes, which is what I used to do. So you can see this cheek is becoming really rounded, and that is just by using a very dark red. I'll often go warm in the darks when I've got an orange, you know, central color. It works really, really well. Again, if you've done my tutorials, you will have heard me say this a lot and you're probably thinking, yes, come on, Emily, get on with it. Going dark um, with warmer, warmer colors like a red is much easier than going dark with colors like a yellow, which we're going to use in the lighter areas because yellow doesn't have a very strong what's known as tinting power. So you lose the, the color very, very quickly as soon as you start to make it lighter or darker. Effectively, as soon as you start to desaturate it, um, you lose the original color and you just get like a brown very, very quickly. Whereas when we use red, darker and lighter, it retains much more of the original color. So likewise, I'm just gonna make this shadow around her eye here darker. I'm, I'm using the second reference in harmony with my first. It's a really, really beautiful photo for the colors, but the, uh, the pose wasn't quite as good. This is another fab pencil, the 188. When you're doing um, horses and when you have a selection of red tones and colors that you, you need to make particularly bright and vivid, this is a fantastic pencil. The coverage from this is amazing. But of course, you do need to then be a little bit careful just to make sure that if you are using it on a slightly more delicate painting, you don't end up turning the whole thing orange because it does have a really great tinting power to it. So it will, it will change the color of your drawing quite easily. And I am mixing in some slightly less saturated, so less colorful pencils in with this. So this is the 180, which is really just a neutral brown. And I do that just so that these areas of saturation actually have something to contrast against. So if we put in something that is less saturated and also includes some of the complementaries, such as the, the green there, then it's going to make the oranges feel brighter. And it also, it prevents your whole drawing becoming flat, not in terms of tones, because we're adding darks and lighter areas, but flat in terms of the, the colors that you're using. It's like too much of a good thing. If you just make it bright and pop all over, your eye doesn't really know where to rest and there's nothing to make this look particularly interesting. So always make sure that, you know, your tones are contrasted. So you've got lights and you've got darks, but your colors are contrasted. You've got areas that are more saturated, areas that are less saturated. You've maybe got your complementary in there. So your opposite color, all sorts of different things you can do. But adding, adding contrast is incredibly important. Now, don't worry, she is not going to remain yellow. Sometimes just help me see where I'm going to be headed. I will just lay down a really saturated, obvious version of a color that I want. I want to be in those areas, but actually is going to end up being, of course, less saturated, but is ultimately going to be the dominant color. But whenever you're, you're doing wildlife, it's always going to be 
a brown in the end of some sort. But this can just help me. Now I can really feel the roundness of the face coming out. And I'm using a lot of color temperature really to create form. I am using tone, but it's that red to orange to yellow transition that I really want to play with. And we really want to to use to create the the overall structure of of the head and I have a couple of horse tutorials I think you know if you're interested in doing equine portraiture there is a black horse portrait um it's almost comes down to the chest actually it comes down quite a long way and that is a full proper tutorial and again I'm using the same kind of ideas but this is on a black horse so we've got purples and blues in there and that was that was amazing to draw. I absolutely love drawing horses. So, you know, if, you, if you're interested in progressing your equine portraiture further, definitely go and have a look at that one, especially if you're trying to do a black coat because it will really help you. I also go into the structure of the horse's head in that video. Um, again, just to help you give, give you a couple of landmarks. So if you've got a poorer reference photo than mine and you, you've got to work from that photo and you want to, then you can hopefully build a bit more of the structure more accurately and make your life a little bit easier. Right, so I'm not gonna be using brown um, for this area of the nose, it's going to be much more gray. But I just need to pick out my outline again because again, there are some really important shadows to be finding in here. And because I'm going between two reference photos, how severe the shadows are in one photo compared to the next changes quite a bit. And it can be quite confusing to try and get them into the right area. I just wanna make this bit a little bit more pronounced. Not quite in this way, but uh, again, it's just going to help me to pick out where I'm going next. I do tend to jump around drawings when I'm just drawing as opposed to teaching. I tend to like to watch how other people draw though, because I have to say it's one of the best ways to learn just by analysing what they're doing and thinking about the process and then considering what you would do as well. No, I wouldn't do that because for me, it makes more sense to work over here next. See how they pull the rest of the drawing together and then consider, okay, was that the better way to do it? Or have you come up with a, a solution that makes more sense in your mind? Um, a lot of it is just about confidence with drawing. And that's when you're able to get into this kind of creative flow and you're thinking less about what you're doing and it becomes much more intuitive because your, your conscious brain isn't getting in the way of what you already know effectively. And then I'm going to step physically away from my drawing. Um, I haven't really done this enough since I started this portrait. I really get into them and just see how the overall structure is actually looking from a bit further away. Yeah, I'm super happy with how this is starting to look. She's um, She's got some beautiful, beautiful colours and lots of form and structure as well. Okay, so I just realized what I'm starting to do is pick in areas when actually the rest of the structure needs to go in. And I will catch myself doing this quite a lot. So if you know that you're someone who does this, it's either a really good time to take a break or just consciously make yourself leave that area and go and do the other bits. So I'm gonna put the neck in. I might need to grab some crystal paper for doing this bit because of course I am right-handed. So I'm gonna be dragging it all over where the face is if I'm not careful. And I'm working on an upright today. When I used to be a full-time pet portrait artist, then I would always work on upright just because it's better for my back and, you know, longevity of working and all that. And then since moving, I didn't actually, well, I didn't have my studio easel anymore. I sold it a couple of years ago because we lived in a flat for a little while while we were looking for a house. And it just wasn't space. It was so much stuff. And I kind of find if I have too much stuff, my head feels really full. And I just thought, no, I need to get rid of stuff. And it was a really large studio easel anyway. It took up a lot of floor space um, and was quite wobbly. So I couldn't film when I was using it anyway. And then spending way too many hours on Pinterest. Of course, came across a really obvious and fantastic idea. Just attach an easel to the wall. So... This is actually the, the prototype version out of some just cheap wood and um, see whether I liked it, whether it worked and whether I was actually gonna use it, but I really do like it. So I'm gonna make a proper one out of better wood because um, this is just a bit, it's that wood that's almost like polystyrene. It's so rubbish. So I'm gonna make a better one, but it is absolutely fantastic. And of course it doesn't wobble around because it's attached to the wall. So the only bit that moves really is the, the board inside the, the, 
the easel catch here. So I'm going to make one that's got a much larger plate at the top and probably actually have two easels side by side. So for really big boards, um, it's going to be supported twice, but it's absolutely fab. I love it so much. And working on an upright just means that all the pastel can drop straight down. So actually it's much better for your drawing if you've got the ability to work on an upright. Right, so you can see how filling in that has helped with the face. This shadow could potentially go a bit darker, I'm thinking. It's a little bit soft now we've got the dark of the neck in. So the next big area that needs to be filled in is her nose. I mean quite light with the pencil when I do this because I can, to an extent, rub it out. Again, I'm going to use some of the sage green. I might try and get a bit of blue in, but I really need... I need a blue that I haven't got. I need like a... A blue of this almost, a uh, desaturated grey blue, but not as light as I've got a Stabilo Carbothello Cool Light Grey number two, and that's just going to be too light for this. You know what? I think this will do. It's a Creta colour, number 53. Again, I don't have a lot of the Creta colours, but I do like their colour selection. I think what really just lets them down for me and puts me off buying a set, for example, is that they break. They just break quite a lot and they are difficult to sharpen. So it becomes quite expensive and it's wasteful. I, I do like them as, as a brand. They do some nice colors, some really, really useful tones. Um, so I've always got a couple, but I, if I'm ever ordering them and I'm ordering, you know, my old time favorites, then I have to order like three at a time because I know full well that they're going to break quite quickly. So not the best advertisement there for... <laughs> For Creta Colour, I do like them. So this is actually another Creta Colour. It's their Ochre Dark. I used to use this pencil all the time. People that used to come to my in-person classes will probably be waving at this one like an old friend. Um, I don't use it as much now. Again, I think it's probably just because I've got better at mixing other colours together to get a, an effect without relying on a, a pencil that is unreliable. But it is a good colour. Because although it's an orange, it's not super orange. It's um, it's a bit milky. It's been desaturated with white. And this makes it nice and soft for doing animal work that obviously, generally speaking, is not bright and colourful. It will always be a little bit desaturated with some brown. So it is useful. It's just not very reliable. Okay, and then in with the dark grey. I've currently got the warm dark grey, but I think I probably should be going for the cool So I'm taking the 181 instead, which is a cool dark grey. Probably going to mix both of the greys together, but this is a lot more blue. And considering I've just spent time putting down blues and greens, going over it with only a warm dark grey doesn't really make a lot of sense. It makes more sense to mix these greys together. So I'll probably make the shadows a little bit warmer with the 175 which is the warm dark grey. And I think it's potentially a bit darker than this 181 as well, maybe. And then the rest of it, I'm gonna go over with this one. So I'm really just working backwards and forwards on the transition at the minute. Nearly dropped a pencil. It's not going to remain quite as colourful as this. Obviously, this is unrealistic with the amount of green and pink and orange in there. Uh, but at the same time, I do want a degree of colour left just so it's it's more of a piece of art and not just a copy of a photograph. It makes it makes them a lot, a lot more interesting in my opinion. I suppose it's to some degree a bit of my style as well. I really, I love colour so much. Uh, if I could be, I would actually be an expressionist painter. But every time I try it, it just looks horrific and um, really crushes my soul. So I, I have a really strong love-hate relationship with painting and then end up coming back to what I know, which is realism. I think a lot of people who enjoy 
realistic art don't necessarily newer drop a pencil don't necessarily have a lot of time for more expressionistic work i'm being very general here of course there are plenty of people who enjoy both types of art but i i really love expressionist painting i love i love painting that's all just about color or mark making i, I really enjoy lots of different types of art and would like to be able to do more of them but i think because i've got quite a technical head on my shoulders i find it really difficult to fully let go and just be guided by color instinct or whatever uh, and just just create something because the paint's enjoyable to work with or because I want to express I don't know a walk I went on but not not literally by painting the landscape I want to express it in a different way and I really envy artists that are able to do that and let go uh, it is what I try and do in the background believe it or not might sound a bit odd coming from someone who's doing it's not photorealistic work but it's it's realism yep i actually have a love for something quite quite different i suppose we've all got aspirations and i sit there and watch lots of videos of people painting expressively and just think oh why can't i just turn my brain off for half a second and just enjoy it but uh it's kind of like i was saying earlier about painting intuitively but within the realms of realism here and to an extent you've you have got to let confidence take over and just allow allow your arm to make the marks that you know are going to make sense put down the colors that you know make sense even if you can't necessarily put into words why uh, so I should really take my own medicine and give it a go but I find it so so difficult and then very frustrating which does mean I can completely empathize with you if you're wanting to learn how to draw like this and you're really struggling it is difficult but it is definitely just practice I'm afraid um, I spent years practicing quite intensely even when I was younger so uh, coming back to what I spoke about earlier if I've left it in the edit I spoke about my first exhibition uh, my first exhibition would have been when I was about 22 23 I think so you know young but at the same time I have had plenty of plenty of years to practice drawing and I, I look quite young for my age as well especially then so people probably thought I was a bit younger um, who didn't know me and people would come in and there was they would constantly use the word talented talented and I'd be really interested to know what other artists and other creatives think about that word but for me it's quite a loaded word because people would say it and obviously you know they're, they're being nice I don't I don't mean to uh, discredit them giving me a, a compliment it's very it is very lovely however I have a lot of difficulty with the word talented because and let me explain I don't I don't consider myself talented I consider myself somebody who really enjoys art and because I really enjoy art I have spent many many hours doing it you know at first just doing it for pure joy and I'm talking about the ages of you know five to fifteen but I would spend hours, hours drawing. And therefore, you know, in, in class, I was one of the kids who, who could draw in inverted commas. I was one of the kids who was, again, inverted commas, good at art. But that was just because I enjoyed it. And I'd spend a lot of time on, on the weekends drawing. You know, I was the kid to get up early in the morning. We weren't allowed to watch TV in the morning. So I would go and start drawing. And most of the stuff I made, unsurprisingly, was complete rubbish. But spending so many hours as a kid drawing you're going to start to improve especially if you you really enjoy it and you've got a you've got a dedicated interest and I had a dedicated interest in realism so I would spend a lot of time trying to make stuff look realistic and it would never work but I guess maybe because I was a kid and because you're kind of used to stuff not going right like I carried on and probably was about a level that I really started to to make work that was half decent and I started to really try and learn and I'd get onto YouTube you know it's not early days of YouTube but it's early days of YouTube for good tuition um, at that point and I would try and source the channels that were putting out quality content I would research oh what's this something called color theory I'd research proportions and perspective and I, I was trying to actively learn so there are quite a few years really of dedicated um conscious learning I would call it 
behind me. And before that was just many years of enjoying drawing, which obviously is the most important thing. Don't do something unless you enjoy it. So, you know, I had had a lot of practice behind me, but a lot of conscious practice as well. So when people came in and just kind of would say, I'm, I'm lucky because I'm talented, you know, I often would say, oh, you know, thank you very much because people would enjoy looking at the work or think it was think it was accomplished or whatever and obviously that does a lot for your ego I'm not going to deny it but I would often say gently but often say you know actually it's it is a practice to be perfectly honest I'd get a lot of people saying oh I wish I could draw but I can't draw and having taught people who would say that they can't draw and then getting them to a stage where they'd be like I can't believe I've done that I honestly think anyone can draw but it is the case of how much you want it and, you know, the same goes for anything. I play the violin, but I don't play it very well because I don't practice enough because I prefer spending time drawing. So my drawing has exceeded how well I can play the violin because I just, I don't play the violin often enough. I'm not saying I would be the next Nigel Kennedy if I'd practiced enough. I probably wouldn't have been. But again, that's because my interest in it wasn't as deep as my interest in art. So I would never spend the same amount of time on it. I wouldn't spend as much time thinking about it um, and, you know, therefore dedicating to that practice. So I'd love to know what you think about talent because I I don't believe in talent. I believe in interests and people are born with different interests and different things that make them tick. And therefore, whether they realize it or not, they'll spend a lot more time thinking about that and improving their skills in that area than they would in others because it's where it's where their interests lie they're gonna they're gonna watch stuff they're gonna read stuff they're gonna think about it okay so having put in the nose now um obviously it changes the way the painting looks again in terms of the tonal structure and i'm just going to make the back of the neck darker now generally speaking when i'm doing equine portraits I tend not to put a lot of hair detail into the face. This will depend slightly on the reference photo. It will depend on the breed of the horse. And it's also going to depend on the scale of your drawing. But my absolute all-time favourite equine piece of work has to be Whistle Jacket uh, in the National Gallery. Just a stunning piece. I always make a beeline straight for it and just stand in front of that for a while whenever I go to the National Gallery in London because it is just... What a piece of work, absolutely fantastic. And you know, completely smooth in the finish and looks really, really good. You're not missing texture in that. You've got a proper shine all over the coat. It looks absolutely brilliant. And the other thing is, especially with horses, when we think of them, we don't think of them as furry animals. Um, obviously ponies and such are a bit different, but we don't think of them as being really furry and fluffy. So it's much better, in my opinion, to get these interesting colours and tones in there and then remember that you never stand right next to a portrait. So if you're putting lots of fine details in, by the time you stand far away, you're not actually going to see a lot of them. What you're going to see is the overall form. So I'll probably add a few in here and there, but I don't go all over the face and create lots of fine hairs. They, they kind of get lost. And generally speaking, I think you get a nicer finish for that, you know, real shine over the coat uh, by just not putting them in. You might be looking and thinking, God, you're really intensifying these colours at the minute, um, especially from, you know, the original reference photo for the pose. But what's really nice, especially about working with this client, I've worked with her before, lovely lady. She specifically sent through the extra photo that I'm using for the colours to say, this one gives you a really good idea of the colours in the fur. So I know that these rich, warm colours, I mean, I know that they can see them in the fur, but I also know that for her, that was the reference that was like, oh, these are the colours. These are the colours that we have in the coat. So the ears are an area that I would add a few detail marks into. They are fluffier. It'll probably have the most texture, that and the mane. And we can make them nice and fluffy. So I'm just making sure that the underpainting's well blended in. A blended in underpainting will give us a nice fluffy start for this. So the mane's a funny one because between the two reference photo, it changes quite a lot. So actually in the color reference photo, it's really yellow. I'm going to make sure that I do get some intense reds underneath there for the shadows. And then just be really careful when I put it in that I don't make it look Simpson yellow. You know, if you go too far, it won't look very nice. 
So if you've been wondering throughout this, like where is the, where does the underpainting start? When does that stage finish and all of this? With horses, I draw them differently. And the, the sort of definition, if you like, between each stage of the drawing is far more loose because I don't, as I say, I don't go in with top layer, of, layer details over everything. So I'm kind of thinking about the finished result from the beginning because all of these colors I'm using are going to be visible to some degree. I suppose for me, because I've, I've drawn them for quite a while, I really enjoy drawing horses. I find them in inverted commas without you know sounding too piggish, but I, sound them, I find them quite easy to draw. But if you're starting out, you might actually find this quite difficult. And don't worry, that's fine because there aren't as many stages to stop and think, oh, I'm going to cover that bit up and I'm going to change that bit. It kind of is, it's an organic thing that comes together as opposed to your underpainting stage, modeling out the mid-tones and then putting details on top. And that is the order that I would, you know, normally classically do a portrait, especially one with a very hairy creature in it, where we've got to put the top layer of details over. So at the end of any drawing, I would normally go back in and just pick out the darkest darks and the lightest lights, it's very, um, pay special attention to the eye because we will need a certain degree of black in the eye. We're gonna need a certain degree of um, white or a very light tone for a reflection in there. And they become dulled over the course of the drawing, as you can see. So they do need to be reestablished at the end of pretty much any drawing that you do. I hope you've enjoyed this art chat and time lapse of this stunning horse portrait. There's been a lot of random chat going on and if you want to find out more about in-depth techniques and take a look at my YouTube channel and why not also hop over and see what else is available in the paid members section. There's actually a brand new pet portrait course coming out in 2024. It will be linked below if it's live already.